Thank you very much, Barry. It's a long reading, but it's a good reading. It's, uh, it's quite cool hearing about what happened there on that day of Pentecost. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's so good to be with you guys this morning. You know, I'm just blown away. Um, God is so amazing. Uh, his love, as the psalmist says, is better than life, isn't it? His love is better than life. Um, and his word is wonderful. I mean, just listen to some of the things that are said there, that he's loosed the pangs of death. Death no longer has, has anything. Death's got nothing now because um, Jesus has conquered it. Um, his word is wonderful. You know, it's like honey to the taste. It's, uh, it's really sweet to the soul. Well, his word which we are coming to this morning is the truth which sets us free, because it reveals to us the truth about who we are and why we are, but more importantly about who God is. But you think about this. Aren't those first two things the driving force behind so much of people's living? So much of, almost everything people do is driven by one or both of those two questions. Who am I? I don't know. Um, I, I'm sporty, so I suppose I'm that. I like this and I don't like that, so I suppose I'm that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy or I'm a girl or I'm a this or I'm a that. Uh, and, and people try to find their identity and who they are through life. They try to piece everything together, um, kind of like a jigsaw that doesn't quite fit. Um, and I think it produces a lot of anxiety um, in, in our world. But also the other one, why? Why am I? Well, if, if the whole reason why I'm here is just, well, I suppose I just should just be nice and don't harm anyone and just get as much satisfaction out of life as I can, then that's all people will really live for and they won't realise who God created them to be. They won't realise that they were made for the glory of God. Like, um, oh, have you seen these? Who, who's seen these? There's like a little comic strip. Okay, so basically the comic strip goes that you've got God there and he's just going, I'm going to make, say, Thomas. And it says, I'm going to put 30% awesomeness, uh, 5% uh, just like handsome manness. And then he's holding, and then he's holding a cup of, he's holding a cup of this dude is the most epic guy in the world. And he accidentally drops the whole thing in. Um, and voila, we have Thomas. <laughs> People don't know who they are, uh, and they don't know why they are. And without the God who loves them and gave them life, they're left with only their hearts, their minds, and the circumstances of life to try and answer that question. It's strange, isn't it? You wouldn't refuse to let the artist explain his own painting or artwork, and yet people made by God in his own image refuse him the right to give them purpose and identity. So the clay talks back to the potter, I suppose. But I tell you, when you find out what God says about who we are and why we are, it is more exciting and wonderful than even the best of your imaginations. Now I have a question for you. Have you ever walked in halfway through a movie or a series or a movie series? Dun, 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 dun. Who likes Captain America? Yes! yes. Best Avenger. Um, <laughs> um, but... If, if you've ever walked in halfway through a movie, uh, you've <laughs> if you've ever walked in halfway through a movie, you're one of two kinds of people. Um, the first kind, uh, if you jump in halfway through a movie, you don't find it that difficult to to connect the dots and place yourself in the story. Um, you can kind of pick that up pretty quickly. You're pretty intuitive with that. But the other kind of uh, person who walks in halfway through a movie walks in and it's just like. Uh, Oh, I don't, I don't know. Um, this is DC? No, it's Marvel. Okay, but he's the good guy. No, he's the bad guy. Okay, um, and they're there. No, they're there. Oh, okay. oh, I have no idea. You know, then they just can't make sense of where they are in the story. So I'm aware that as amazing as this uh, passage is, that it can, it can be a little bit disorienting because we're thinking... Um, Okay, I get that we're here and the Spirit's kind of coming and that's all really cool and wow, it sounds awesome, but kind of like, why is this all happening again? And um, yeah. So let's take a deep breath. Don't glaze over. I'm not going to steam ahead and leave you behind. Let's quickly recap. Well, so where are we? 
Well, we've been doing a series called Plain to See, the transformative power of the risen Jesus. <laughs> and we've been looking at all these times where people encountered the risen Jesus and how those encounters radically transformed their lives. We've seen Mary consoled. She's the first person Jesus sees after being raised from the dead. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen... <laughs> sorry. We've seen Peter restored. He denied him three times, and then Jesus comes to him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? We're all good, Peter. And then we have Thomas finding faith. Uh, I won't believe until I see it. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Hey, Thomas, put your your finger there. Put your hand in my side. I really did rise from the dead. He finds faith. And the disciples were commissioned, as we heard Alan preach two weeks ago. That was cool, wasn't it, to hear Alan preach? That was awesome. Thank you, God, for Alan. Um, commissioned. And last week, Nathaniel talked on the risen Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven, when he now rules as Lord in Christ, as we've heard in our passage this morning. So I hope that's a helpful recap and puts us back in, back in the story, um, because this week we pick up where Jesus left off before he ascended. He said, okay, I'm ascending. Go wait in Jerusalem. I'm going to give you my spirit You'll be my witnesses. Cool. We're in Jerusalem, and here they are. They wait for the Spirit, and they receive it. Now, this is, if we're talking about encounters here, encounters of the risen Jesus were pretty cool. This is like a mega encounter. This is like God filling uh, his church. So picture it. There's about 100 people in the room, okay? and it's a room probably like this, okay? Um, There's about 100 people in the room, not too different from this. And suppose that we, just like them, are kind of just sitting here. uh, And perhaps we're praying. When all of a sudden, it sounds, doesn't feel, but sounds like a hurricane gale just swoops in and rushes through the room. Just, I mean, we're all just sitting there. It's like, what on earth is that? Okay, all right. Now things get even more interesting. Now, everyone look up. Look up. Okay, so, so about the height of the projectors, okay? See the empty space and air in front of us here? Okay, so imagine if just over people's heads, roughly, you saw like balls of fire, probably the size of my fist, just starting to go. And there's just this sheet of fire, fiery tongues, about the height of these projectors here, and it starts lowering and falling on people. <laughs> That is a pretty intense experience, isn't it? But things get even more interesting. Now, at that moment, picture this. That the moment the flames land on different people's heads, they were speaking Aramaic before, now they're speaking Greek. Now they're speaking Latin. Now they're speaking Japanese, possibly. Um, It says all nations are um, under heaven. And so let's pretend for a moment that I'm Spanish. (laughs) <laughs> this is kind of what it would be like. I mean, you guys know, I've never spoken English a day in my life. Um, Hola, mi nombre es Timothy. Yo soy Christian. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, you know, Hola, mi nombre es Timothy. Tu es mi amigo. You know, the fire lands on my head. And then all of a sudden, I break out into English, and I'm just like, whoa, God, you are the almighty creator of heaven and earth, Jesus. You have been sent. You are the son of God. You've died for my sins. You've redeemed me back to the image of God. All just, all, you're just declaring the mighty works of God, as it says in the passage. Man, that's all pretty intense, isn't it? When you picture it, when you actually think about this actually happened. This isn't a nice story. It, this happened in a room kind of like this in, in Jerusalem in first century Palestine. Now, because of all the commotion and the things that people were hearing, each in their own language, a massive crowd starts to gather around the house. What on earth is going on here? Where they were meeting, standing either in amazement and wonder, what's going on here, dude? Like, I'm hearing him in my own language. He's talking about Jesus. What's this about, you know? Um, Or they're standing there in mockery. Ugh, drunk. They're drunk. Goodness, they're, they're just nonsense, idiots. Then Peter gets up and preaches an amazing sermon. Now, I read a quote from one of my uh, favorite preachers in preparation for this morning, and he said this, You don't have to advertise a fire. When people see a fire, they come running. Likewise, if your church is on fire, you will not have to advertise it. 
your community will know it because you will be so in love with God. You'll be so in love with each other. You'll be so filled with the love and the life of God. It'll be vibrant and it will just burst out like a consuming flame. And, and don't we want to so know God and so love God and so love each other that, that, that it's like a bonfire and just people uh, come and gather around it and are warmed by it? However, does this, does this mean that every Sunday we meet, we ought to make a massive commotion? I know some people um, in history have thought that, yeah, that's the answer. Let's just amp things up and just really pumpy. And, um, and, and like, that's fun. Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even slamming that. That's fine if you want to do that. It's quite cool. It's quite fun. But um, it's not, that's not what the Spirit's all about, hyping things up. But at the same time, we, we always have to remember that we need to be open to what the Spirit of God wants to do among His people, don't we? And so... I find it interesting that Jesus said to his disciples that they first needed the Holy Spirit before they could be effective witnesses. Isn't that interesting? Perhaps here it's a good example and reminder to us that we at St. Stephen's need him for everything in life if we would be good servants of Jesus. We should be seeking as believers and as a community the filling and the leading of the Spirit in all of our endeavours if we would do the will of God. Now, intense as all this is, when Peter gets up to speak, we start getting into the meat and bones of what is really happening here and what is the the meaning of all of this. As Peter lays out the the gospel in in, in three parts here, um, and he he keeps looking back to these prophets who have talked about it long before it even happened. If you have your Bibles, uh, follow along um, in verse 14. This is Peter's uh, big message Peter wants to get across. Verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock. But this is what was uttered, this is what was uttered through the prophet John. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons shall prophesy, and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Some cool stuff about what's going to happen in the end. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All this is happening, the the, the wind, the fire, the people there, amazed, mocking. And Peter, who was a coward to the face of a young girl, now filled with the Spirit, has boldness to stand before thousands. And what is he saying? He's saying, guys, don't you see? God's always been planning this. This is what God has always being about, he's always wanted to pour out his spirit on his people. And, and why? Um, well, we, we, we talked, we mentioned at the beginning of this that the word of God tells us who we are and why we are. If you were to go back to the beginning and you think about how God made humanity, he makes, and we talked about it in the puppet show earlier, in fact, as well, he, he made us in his image. He didn't, he didn't make us to be selfish. He didn't make us to lie and hate and cheat and, and, and do all these things. These are not his image. These are not what he's like. These are not who we are. Hey. And these are not why we are either. He creates us in his image. How beautiful and amazing is God? Right? How amazing is it? The Bible says God is love. And we're made in the image of love, perfect love. That's incredible. And isn't that an incredible identity to now find through the word of God that we were always created to be and express just that love, just who God is. That incredible boldness and strength of the love of God. And the word also tells us why we are. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Cultivate this earth. Be creative. Cultivate. Express my glory. Express who I am. 
enjoy me, enjoy this world. There's no downside to this. There's no catch-22. There's no, there's no, ah, yeah, but there's a catch. He, he made us for this amazing and glorious life to express the glory of God. And I think that's what we should really take when we, when we hear Peter saying this. Because he's, he's saying that God has always planned it. Because you want to know what went wrong. What went wrong is we turned away from God. We sinned. We, we turned away from God. There was a separation between us and God. We turned from, we refused him and rejected his ways and embraced uh, selfishness and went our ways and opposite to God. And that created that, that, that tearing apart of us and God, which was not meant to be torn apart. And that's why there is all the confusion around who am I? Why am I? But what is happening here in the passage, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Man, the spirit is how God unites people back to himself. There's actually a place where it says, and I will become one spirit with my people. It's an incredibly intimate image. God wants to restore that beautiful union and relationship that we had with God in the beginning. Um, and in fact, just make it all the better through Jesus. So he's saying, this is always his plan. But there's something else that's happened here. Obviously, if we look at the first 13 verses, it's not just that God's been planning it, now it's coming about. Now it is coming about. He's planned it, but he's also done it. But now, here's where it gets very good um, for us today. These are not dead tales, these are not old stories that happened in the past, were amazing, but they stay in the past. You know the same Peter who preached this sermon? I want to read you something he, he wrote, actually. Because, you know, he wrote two letters in the New Testament. Um, I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, if you ever want to, just, to, just on a, a little bit of a tangent, if you ever want to know um, an interesting way to see the Old Testament, if that ever confuses you, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read the end of it. It's fascinating. But here, listen to this. Listen to this. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, they searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ, that's interesting, Christ's Spirit in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So the prophets, Joel, who he is quoting, and the other two places he quotes, if you keep reading the passage, the, the two Psalms he put, um, quotes there, what Peter is saying is that, man, when these guys are prophesying, they know that they're talking about, all right, all right, God, who is this guy? All right, God, when is this guy? All right, God, what's he going to suffer? Okay, God, what, how's he going to be glorified? That's really cool. But it, this, is, this is why I wanted to quote this, because this is the good part. This is the part for, for you and me. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And the things which have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. He planned it. Peter points that out. Guys, he's always been planning this. He did it. We saw the Spirit come upon this early church. The wind gushes through. The fire comes down. They're filled with the Spirit and declare the glory of God. But now, guess what? He does it still. He does it still. And he wants us to come to him, to receive his Spirit. What does Peter say at the end of that? They, the crowd hears all of this. And what do they say? Brothers, what shall we do? And what does Peter say? Repent. Be baptized. And you will receive the promise of the Spirit. Jesus taught in the Gospel of Luke, What father among you, having a child, if he asks him for a piece of bread, will give him a stone? Or asks for an egg, will give him a snake? If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? He wants to give you the spirit he wants to unite you to himself he wants to redeem who am i this is who you are why am i this is why you are 
He's always been planning it. He's now done it, and he does it still. And all we have to do is but ask. You know, reading all this and talking about this is actually making me really excited to come to the Pentecost evening tonight, actually, because I think that's just going to be a really, really awesome time with God. I want to read one more verse, um, and, then, and then we'll pray. God's done something so amazing here. Um, and it's just communicated really clearly in Titus 3, verse 3 onwards. Have a listen to these words. We may have been going a while, but I pray these words touch your heart. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Because Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. He knows who we are. He knows why we are. He created us. He's planned it. He's done it. But he does it still. <coughs> Come to him. Ask of him. And you'll receive. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, you are so kind. Your word says you're kind even to the evil and ungrateful, such as your love. You are so magnificent in your love. God, we've heard your word this morning, how you want to unite us to you. You want to become one spirit with us, to give us your spirit, that we might be redeemed. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We ask that you lead us in right ways. We ask for your Holy Spirit. God, fill us afresh, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.